So thank you everybody for being here. Uh, we are really happy now to announce the 17th conference of the Disruption Network Lab, a citizen of evidence, investi uh, independent investigation for change. Uh, but first of all, uh, before going inside the content of today, um, me, Tatiana Bazzichelli and Lieke Plucher would like to uh, thank our team. Um, and uh, first of all, say that uh, really we want to thank their hard work for making this conference possible. So I want to thank Nada Bakker and Monty Harmony that are our project manager. Uh, Jonas Franchi, our designer, uh, Giacomo Marin Salta, the press manager. And so I also ask you please to do nice applause to them because it's thanks to their work also that we are here today. And uh, I also want to start by saying that today is a very special day, it's the day of the uh, climate strike. Uh, so I want to say thank you for the people that are also coming to our event. Um, and I hope that all of you were before uh, striking for the climate, but still we feel to be very connected to that, because uh, when you also hear what is the motto of today, people say our house is on fire, let's act uh, like it. Uh, we, uh, we demand climate justice for everybody. And uh, uh, so the point of uh, demanding climate justice for everybody uh, is connected also to our demand for justice here at the Disruption Letter Club. We are also trying to demand justice for many people since long time of our program. Um, and uh, this is also connected with uh, our series of this year that the, is the art of exposing injustice that we are doing in partnership with Transparency International. So uh, today that we want to speak about the power of the citizen in exposing injustice, we also feel connected to what the people are fighting today for. And um, as I say, uh, this is our 17 events, uh, our uh, claim today is to explore the investigative impact of grassroots community and citizen in exposing injustice, corruption and power asymmetries. And uh, um, this is the third event of the series uh, that we are doing as a same partnership with Transparency International. I feel also to thank them a lot because we have been working together also to produce this program. And uh, today we will have also with us Michael Hornby to moderate one of the panels. So this has been a very important cooperation for us. And uh, then I want to thank our funders, the Hauptstadt Kultur Fund, the Capital Culture Fund of Berlin, the Riva and David Logan Foundation. We are also supported by a grant from the Open Society Initiative for Europe within the Open Society Foundation. And also want to thank our funder that is uh, <laughs> with us today, uh, Peter Majessi. And uh, then uh, I want to thank the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation and we are working in partnership with the Friedrich Heber Stiftung. Always the moment that turning the page. <laughs> um, we also have a new founder that we want to thank this time. Uh, we have a special slot uh, this conference that is called Investigation. That is also the second time we are doing this format. And also a workshop on sign the, uh, related to the discourse of open source intelligence. And these activities together also with uh, the community workshop that you are going to mention after are part of the Image in Europe, uh, a program that is co-funded by the Creative Europe uh, uh, of the European Union. Um, so this is also something new of the Disruption Network Club program. And uh, finally, we also want to thank our partner venues, the Kunst and Kreuzberg Bethanien, the State Studio and Supermarkt. And we work in collaboration with the School of Machine Making and Make Believes, the Alexander from Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and our media partners are Taz and Ex Berliner, uh, while the communication partners in Vexant and Furterfield. <laughs> now we did a really long <laughs> list, uh, but also very important because it's also thanks to these uh, people that we are able to do our program. 
And finally, we enter into the content of it. And uh, when we speak about the citizen of evidence, we actually have, first of all, ask ourselves, what does it mean, this definition, when we say citizen of evidence? Uh, so here we want, to, from one side, to speak about uh, the impact and the power of communities and citizens in exposing misconducts and wrongdoings and injustice and abuses, as we were saying. But at the same time, also, we want to focus on the work of practitioners that are bu building up tools to make this possible. So we always have this kind of double side of the Disruption Network Club. From one side, we try to investigate a problem. From the other, also, we try to find the concrete solution to make a change. And um, so another question would also be, if we speak about citizen of evidence, what also evidence means, because uh, it's a difficult uh, word to speak about evidence, especially today uh, when we are also uh, dealing with the fake news or misinformation, how is still possible to produce evidence. But we also think that this is possible, this is what we are discussing here in these days, trying to understand also how to make a change in the reality we live in and how to uh, also collectively discuss uh, how to make this change. So we want to open up a dialogue among uh, different expertise, as we usually do, and at the same time also try to reflect with them how it's possible to uh, imagine a change also that comes from the citizens, how also we can speak about the citizens if uh, we want to touch the discourse of representation. This is also what we will start with, with the first uh, keynote. Uh, but while we are speaking about communities, I also leave the word to Lika that wants to tell us a bit what happened before uh, with the community program. Ah, yeah, I have this mic, it should also work. So, um, yeah, we started this year with a community program called Activation. So, this means that during the year we organize different meetups around the main conferences. And in these meetups we want to connect with, like, uh, local Berlin activists and communities and initiatives that are also working on social, political and cultural change in the same field as the conference topics. Because there's a lot of interesting work happening in Berlin, so uh, we found it very relevant to connect to that more. And we've been doing each time a meetup warming up to the conference, and we will do also a follow-up meetup. So two weeks after this event, we will have another one. So the first meetup that we did, um, actually warming up to this conference, um, uh, and also to mention uh, thanks to the special funders we have for the community program. So as Tatjana mentioned, the community program is part of the Reimagine Europe project, funded by the European Union but also we are supported by the Guerrilla Foundation, so many thanks to them. Um, yeah, we started actually working on this topic with the first community meetup on the 4th of September, and we do these meetups always at State Studio, which is an art and science gallery here in Schöneberg, and the meetup was um, dealing with secure self-hosted file distribution systems, because we thought if we organize this conference, which really focuses on citizens that work on creating social change by doing grassroots investigations, it would be really valuable to give people actually a practical tool that can help in this process. So we wanted to um, yeah, give them something hands-on that they could work on. And we invited the people from Radical Networks and the Weisse Sieben Studio. So Sarah Grant and Dania Vasiliev came to give a workshop. And uh, yeah, they were part of the Radical Networks Conference, which is actually a very interesting event happening next month in New York. Um, and this conference celebrates the free and open internet, but it also is an arts festival that celebrates networking technology as an artistic medium. So what they did in the workshop is uh, to teach our attendees how to set up a Raspberry Pi as a wireless access point and offline web server and then how to set up uh, your own installation of Nextcloud. And this is an open source alternative to, for example, Google Drive or Dropbox. So it was a very nice, very concrete workshop where people could learn um, a tactic for, for getting started on becoming a citizen of evidence. <laughs> Thank you. And now I think we enter into the depth of the keynote. So I thank you, Lieke, sure. and I will call with me on stage Alexandra Wels. Okay. 
And uh, I'm actually also a bit emotional to introduce you, <laughs> uh, because we actually started our history together here in this building back in 2005, when actually 2004, when we organized together the exhibition Hack It Art down at the Kunst and Kreuzberg Bethanien. So uh, the history with uh, Alexandra is a really long uh, one, and. Uh, uh, back in the time, we were speaking a lot about uh, Q, <laughs> the book uh, from uh, former Luther Bliss at now uh, Wuming. And so, so I thought that she was the perfect person to moderate this keynote with the Wuming one. That, by the way, I tried to invite him since four years, and now I'm actually happy that he came. And uh, <laughs> But now I want to introduce um, Alex, that is actually called Alexandra Welz rombach So sorry, I cut the second part of it your surname now, uh, but uh, yes, so the idea is uh, that I will introduce Alex, then we'll introduce uh, Wu Ming Guan, and uh, Alex is an author, filmmaker, and producer, working on documentaries, short reportage, and trailers. She cooperates with NGOs and political initiatives to promote a critical political discourse and make social struggle visible. In 2018, she produced a film on the Cosmo Viertel in Berlin, and she authors online film for the NGOs uh, Oxfams and ECCHR, and uh, a media station on euthanasia in the hospital of Berlin Bach book during the Third Reich. And uh, she also worked on the art uh, documentaries Marx uh, Reloaded, and uh, she made a documentary that we also were discussing a lot back in the time about uh, Tony Negri for Art uh, ZDF with Andrea Spiegler. Now that I introduce you, <laughs> I leave the stage to you to introduce the keynote with Wu Ming Wan. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. <laughs> So now I'm happy to introduce to you Wu Ming, who's going to be our first keynote speaker today. Wu Ming Wan is a founding member of the Wu Ming Collective, uh, formerly known as Luther Blissett. And uh, they are also sometimes called a band of militant storytellers. They are four authors of the famous novel Q, which was published in 1999 and made it to global bestseller status. Maybe some of you have read it. In the past weeks, uh, I read and talked a lot about Wu Ming, and I was asking friends and colleagues what they think, you know, what I should ask him. And uh, to me, because I've experienced uh, with my work on Antonio Negri a little bit of uh, the turmoil and the discourse you can have in the Italian political scene, um, that most of the people I asked were just fond of Wu Ming, and they really liked them, and I even had one friend who said, yeah, I check their website nearly on a daily basis. And um, when she heard when this event is taking place, she was uh, actually thinking to cancel her holiday plans. So um, this is just uh, to tell you a little bit of the great fan base that Wu Ming has gathered over the years. And um, yeah, they're a defined but variable group of authors, ranging from three to five, depending on the project and the period. And in general, uh, Wu Ming are active in literature, but also other cultural activities. And uh, Wu Ming Wan, who we will hear today, uh, wrote his recent solo novel. It's called The Wind Machine, which was published this year. And it's set in uh, 1939 in a camp for anti-fascists. And uh, previously, he authored um, the book no Promise, This Trip Will Be Short, 25 Years of No Tough Struggle, published in 2016, and which is exactly the subject that we're going to hear now. And um, I guess I should say that we really ask to not take any pictures of the panel now, because uh, Wu Ming um, is also very uh, fond of, its, of staying incognito, so please respect their privacy, and please welcome Wu Ming Wan. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, Ghost in the Woods 
and uncanny entities, how I ended up covering the Italian Notav movement. I slightly modified the uh, subheading uh, because uh, my keynote speech will not be about how to cover the Italian Notav, Notav movement, but it, but it will be about my experience, I, how I ended up doing uh, that. I'm not really uh, sure this uh, will be a proper keynote uh, uh, speech. Uh, uh, well, Tatiana says it will be, but um, the experience I'm going to tell you about is very uh, specific and uh, peculiarly uh, related to the evolution of uh, women's writing. Uh, uh, usually a keynote speech establishes the underlying theme of an event. Uh, well, I hope so. Um, I, I'm speaking first only because there was a change in schedule after all, so okay. <laughs> Just wanted to be clear about, about this. Okay, as, um, as a collective of uh, writers, we are modestly, modestly famous for our experiments with uh, the novel form and uh, meta-historical fiction in plain words uh, uh, for such books as uh, Q, which recently inspired uh, an evil far-right conspiracy theory in the US, talk about strange twists and turns in culture, uh, Manitsuana, Altai, the army of sleepwalkers, and so on. However, uh, in the course of uh, uh, the 2010s, we've been experimenting with uh, other forms, writing uh, uh, several heavily researched fact-filled works which one could cursorily describe as creative nonfiction. Uh, looking back to a body of work spanning over 10 years and reflecting upon methodology, I summed it all down to five commandments. One, walk, go where the archive and the road meet each other. Two, look for ghosts in the landscape and ask them questions. Three, explore borderlands. Anything, anything can be seen more clearly from its margins than from its center. Four, use as many writing techniques as you feel necessary, never mind boundaries. Five, don't hide the stitches. People must be able to recognize and discuss your cho choices. Uh, some of these sentences may sound uh, uh, a little Puzzling, uh, let's review them one at a time. It always begins with walking. Uh, we are part of a, a loose, informal community of Italian writers who in recent years uh, have started to reflect on and make use of walking, of wandering around as a cognitive tool. We always use this image, the archive, and the road, or the archive and the street, as the Italian word strada, has both meanings. Uh, you come across uh, something while walking, um, then you search it uh, in the archive, uh, and, and vice versa. You find something in the archive, and then you substantiate it by walking. Uh, the archive, of course, is everything, is potentially everything. The totality of your sources, which you constantly rearrange, it's not necessarily a physical place. Um, some of our works, the longest and mon most uh, demanding ones, are collectively prepared months ahead. Uh, communities form around the announced intent to follow a particular route, and then these communities suggest alternative paths, people to get in touch with, and of course, social and env environmental issues and struggles to cover. Here's an example. Women choose Ciclo dei Sentieri, Tetralogy of Footpaths. It is a series of books still in the making, 
Four books in which Wu Ming Tu, my colleague Wu Ming Tu, explores the radical transformation of Italy's landscapes by walking along the routes of high-speed railways. Two books have uh, already been published. Il Sentiero degli Dei, The Footpath of Gods, which was published in uh, 2010, and Il Sentiero Luminoso, The Shining Path, which was published in 2016. The Footpath of um, Gods narrates a five-day walk from Bologna to Florence across the Apennine Mountains. Uh, that is the only uh, part of the country where the Apennines are a more or less latitudinal range, which means that the watershed goes roughly from west to east instead of going from north to south. This means that uh, the Apennines are a borderland between northern Italy and central Italy. Uh, two very different macro regions with very different histories. Um, there, is a, there is an ancient footpath crossing the range called Footpath of Gods because some mountains and villages have names of Greek and Roman divinities. You see Mount Venus, Mount Adonis, Mount Juno. Uh, the path had been abandoned uh, Wu Ming Tu gave a major contribution in rediscovering it, uh, then walked straight to Florence and wrote a very hybrid book, uh, merging uh, such forms and genres as uh, travelogue, trekking guide, novel, reportage, because he reported on environmental disasters caused by the construction of the Bologna-Florence high-speed railway, um, and, and there's m even more than that, uh, because the book is also a collection of ghost stories. Um, uh, ghosts appear to Wu Ming Tu every single night he spends along the route in the woods, uh, and they are the ghosts of railroad workers who died about 100 years ago while constructing the older line, the so-called Direttissima. Uh, Il Sentiero Luminoso, The Shining Path, uh, chronicles a seven-day walk from Bologna to Milan, cutting through the Padan Plain, uh, that is the valley of the Po River, which is heavily, heavily concreted over. It's devastated by concrete and asphalt, and the book is about that. Uh, the next uh, two legs of uh, Wu Ming Tu's journey will be from Milan to Turin, and uh, then from Turin to Italy's northwestern border, the border with France, he is going to walk along the Susa Valley, of which I'm going to talk in a few minutes, because the Susa Valley is the home of the Notav movement. We just mentioned the ghosts. Ghosts are very important in our poetical and analytical stance. What is a ghost? Even in our classics, the appearance of a ghost often signals the surprising relevance uh, of a story that was told badly, uh, that was told in a wrong or partial way. Uh, the appearance of a ghost is always about an unresolved conflict. It's the return of the repressed. In Hamlet, for example, this return is eminently political, as suspected by Horatio in the very first scene of the tragedy. He and Marcellus are commenting uh, upon the recurring appearance of King Hamlet's specter on, on the watchtower. They say, first twice before and jump at this dead hour, with martial stalk hath he gone by our watch. And Horatio, in what particular thought to work I know not, but in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. The appearance of a ghost is political. It bodes some strange eruption to our state. Ghosts are a recurrent theme in uh, our books uh, as well especially in um, our uh, more geographical books. By ghosts, 
uh, we mean suppressed memories of the social conflict that shaped a territory. Uh, the way ghosts manifest themselves to us may give us insights into the future of social conflict in that territory. We also mentioned borderlands. It was one of the five rules that I listed. Uh, borderlands are the places where there's more density of ghosts. The history of Italy, probably of any nation state, can be better understood with all its contradictions only by studying the history of its borders. But I'm using another word, I'm using the word borderland, because a border is not simply a line, it is always an intersection, it is always a zone. As the border shapes the territory and affects lives and culture on both sides, people are separated from each other by a border, but the border is also what they have in common. An Italian historian, Matteo Melchiorre, wrote that a border is solvent and glue at the same time. We're in Berlin, I don't need to spend too many words on this. And it's uh, even more complicated than that um, because uh, there are borderlands even when there's no official border anymore. When a border shifts, it leaves something behind. The ghost of a border keeps affecting culture. This is what happened in the regions of northeastern Italy, which formerly belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were annexed to Italy in 1918 with the victory in the, in the Great War, but they are still inhabited by national minorities speaking German, Slovenian, Latin, and other languages. The 100th anniversary of uh, World War I evoked all kinds of cultural specters in those regions where the war was actually fought. That was the front, the Austro-Italian front. I went there many times and looked for those spect specters and I wrote a book on them titled Centania Nord-Est, Viaggio tra i Fantasmi della Guerra Granda, which means a hundred years in the Northeast, journey among the ghosts of the Great War. Uh, on um, October 29th, 2017, a date which is very important in Italian history because it marks uh, an important anniversary, uh, a crushing defeat of the Italian army in uh, Caporetto. Some comrades of ours, a subversive mountain club called Alpinismo Molotov, I've got the sticker here on my back MacBook, uh, they went to the top of Mount Matajur uh, on the border with Slovenia to perform a ritual of decontamination. Um, by celebrating deserters, desertion. Um, they opened this banner, uh, written in Italian and Slovenian, and it says, welcome back, ghosts of desertion, which is the very last sentence of my book, A Hundred Years in the Northeast. Uh, the last point was show the stitches, so the, show the suture. Of course, this is Robert De Niro uh, in uh, uh, Kenneth Branagh's uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, okay? Uh, very ugly. Uh, we hope our books are not that ugly, uh, but uh, this image is useful because by showing the suture, showing the stitches, we mean declaring our choices either explicitly or by inserting some uh, markers in the text, uh, elements uh, that allow the readers to understand the work done, to follow the changes in pace and register, to ask themselves questions about both the content of the book and the techniques we used to express the content. 
On our part, it is both an ethical and poetical preoccupation because in the past years, too many writers have been uh, caught red-handed and slammed for trying to pass off their fiction as non-fiction, their novels as memoir, their short stories as reportage, controversies regarding, regarded especially two techniques, the use of composites, that is, imaginary characters summing up uh, characteristics of different people the author actually met, and reporting in the first person on events which the author didn't witness directly. They're both uh, legitimate techniques under certain conditions. You got to apply them with awareness, uh, rigor, and respect for the reader, and thematize the fact that you're using them. Over uh, the years, we have worked a lot on environmental issues, the ongoing ecocide, the climate crisis, the relationship uh, between us and the territory we live in. Uh, we did interventions, articles, uh, short stories, talks, workshops, initiatives of many kinds, and of course, books. Um, the Tetralogy of Footpaths, another book called uh, Point Lenana, my own book on the Notav movement, the Cantalamapa stories, which we wrote for children, um, and our latest uh, collective novel, Prolet, Prolet Cult, are all about uh, uh, the environment, the climate crisis, and so on. And also my next uh, uh, unidentified narrative uh, object uh, will be about uh, the climate breakdown. Um, looking back, I realized that we wrote a lot about mountains. Why are mountains so important in our books, our discourses, and our activities? Because they are extremely important in Italy. Italy is one of the most mountainous countries in Europe, with 35% of its territory covered by the Alps and the Apennines, as you can see. And... Uh, 42% uh, by hills. By the way, this is one of the reasons uh, why um, constructing high-speed uh, railways was so expensive and catastrophic for the environment because they had to excavate many, many mountains. Um, in Italy, the discourse on mountains has long been affected by nationalism, militarism and machismo. After the unification of the country in uh, 1861, uh, the Alps uh, became the bulwarks of the fatherland, the sacred borders of the fatherland, i sacri confini della patria, la patria, the fatherland. The Great War was fought on the Alps, uh, and its geographical outcome was uh, that Italy's land border became almost entirely mountainous. Beyond the Alps, we have, going from uh, east uh, uh, to west, Slovenia, Austria, Switzerland, and France. And there's also a strong link between the Alps and fascism. Fascism has its uh, roots in the myth of the Great War, and mountains uh, had an important role in fascist propaganda because of that. The regime, now you can see Mussolini is king, the Duce, the regime encouraged mountaineering as um, it perfectly served their aims uh, because it engendered bravery. It was a, represent a representation of virility, manhood, and at the same time, by planting uh, the flag on conquered peaks, mountaineers reaffirmed that the Alps were Italian. Nowadays, the Alps evoke stereotypical images that have to do with idyllic landscapes and winter sports, and yet they have always been the theater of wars, invasions, state violence, social conflict and political resistance. In 1943, 
Italian partisans went to the mountains to organize guerrilla warfare against fascism and the Nazi occupation. In Italian, one of the meanings of uh, the phrase andare in montagna is to join the resistance. Uh, most people know Bella Ciao, the Italian partisan song which has become an international protest anthem. Well, mountains are very important in the original lyrics because they say, and if I die as a partisan, you will have to bury me, to bury me up there on the mountains in the shade of a nice flower. And the people passing by, the people passing by will say, what a beautiful flower. This is the flower of the partisan who died for freedom. Today, mountains are besieged by urban sprawl, pollution, mass tourism, winter sports, plants, and major infrastructural projects, mega projects, which many consider dangerous, useless, expensive, and megalomaniac. The most uh, radical and relevant struggle in recent uh, Italian history has been uh, taking place in an Alpine valley the Susa Valley, west of Turin, where people oppose the construction of a new high-speed railway line between Turin and Lyon. In Italian, the acronym for high-speed train is TAV, Treno Alta Velocità, hence the name of the movement, no TAV. On a continental scale, uh, Notav are the most long-lasting, enduring movement opposing a mega-project. The struggle started in 1991. Tens of thousands of people have been taking part to it. 28 years later, the project is still just a project. Under the pressure of the struggle, it's been downsized and modified by the government many times, although it is still a very expensive mega project and the movement is still opposing it. I collected some of the many, many headlines announcing cuts and modifications to the TAV project, because in every phase of this story, the project is nothing but the result of the struggle. The previous project was withdrawn in uh, 2006 after thousands of people clashed with the police and reconquered the big encampment known as Libera Repubblica di Venaus, Free Republic of Venaus. Now, everybody in the state ranks admit that that project, the one they withdrew after this Notav victory, was wrong, it was too expensive, impacting, and yet nobody, nobody ever said thank you to the Notav movement. In the Susa Valley, it is capital that has to respond to the struggle. The struggle forces capital to patch up, to tinker with more and more cuts and downsizing. Each time the government implicitly admitted that the project was wrong, each time the no-tav criticism of the mega-project was accepted without ever admitting it. Every change has always been presented as an initiative taken at the highest echelons of technocratic power, you know, an intelligent revisit revisiting of the project. Uh, we had an idea, you know, the state cannot say the Notav were right, not even on a single point. After almost 30 years of uh, radical confrontation, that truth has become ever, ever more unspeakable. That's why I wrote Unspeakable Victories. If the government said that Notav will write on anything, there will be a huge legitimation crisis. Indeed, every government has repeatedly declared the war on the movement. 
they continuously state that they keep using the iron fist against the movement. More headlines. Tav, Berlusconi's iron fist. We're going to use force to remove the blockades. And that was a right-wing government. Tav, a thorn in Prodi's flesh. And there, that was a wishy-washy, liblab, center-left government. And also, Tav, the government chooses intransigence. We won't tolerate illegality. And what was a technical government, a kind of an apolitical government, if, if such a thing is possible, that was... Uh, put in, in office by the European Union after they discharged Berlusconi at the end of 2011. Uh, the Notav movement paid and is still paying for its own coherence and radicalism with almost 2,000 activists indicted, arrested, subjected to restrictive measures, and with hundreds of years of imprisonment imposed in dozens and dozens of court trials. And yet, nothing could defeat them. They're still there. We are all guilty of resisting. That's what the banner says. Freedom for Notav. And there's much more than that. Because the movement has the cultural hegemony in the valley it affects the whole political life of the region and keeps making successful experiments in participation, self-government, and even collective property. The Notav struggle has anticipated directions and caused the new turns of events in national politics it has become, it created, it created a gravitational field curving the political space-time. How could that happen? And why, of all places, did it happen in such a marginal valley, in such a borderland, the Susa Valley? In the case of other mega-projects in Italy, even more expensive and despicable, Nothing even comparable took place. What was then so peculiar about the Susa Valley? I tried to answer, answer those questions in my book, Un viaggio che non promettiamo breve, 25 anni di lotte Notav. No promise this trip will be short, 25 years of Notav struggles, which was published in 2016. The book was written in the course of three years and a half. In those years, I worked as a historian, a gonzo journalist, a geographer, a horror sci-fi novelist, and an activist, all rolled into one. I followed the five rules. I explained at the beginning of the speech. I went very deep into the movement, taking part in several key moments of the struggle, interviewing more than 40 activists, very long interviews, merging oral history and archival work, blending fiction and non-fiction, walking in the woods and climbing the mountains of the Susa Valley. Just look at the map. Val di Susa is narrow, and very long, it's 90 kilometers long. In those 19 kilometers, there are many worlds alternating, following each other. Um, and they are all Val di Susa, despite being so different from one another. There is even little agreement on the exact starting point of the valley. Um, moving uh, uh, westward from Turin's hinterland, 
You go up and up and up and up, and you reach the border with France at 3,000 kilometers above sea level. But it starts in the metropolis with a rarity, an alpine valley starting in the outskirts of a metropolis. That's bizarre. And then you find the lower part of the valley. The lower part of the valley was industrialized since the 1840s. And an, alpi an alpine valley inhabited by factory workers. That's another strange thing. Factory workers and uh, former factory workers. In fact, the note of movement has a strong industrial working class background. People come from there, even if now most of the factories have been closed. So there's a long history of union struggles, for example, of class struggles. And I studied the class composition of the movement in relationship with the territory. Uh, moving westward again, Protestant churches start to sprout up. You enter a Protestant zone. Uh, there was uh, the Waldensian heresy in, in, in uh, that area of Piedmont. Uh, and that uh, heresy was uh, cruelly repressed by the Catholic Church. They had to flee to France. A few centuries later, they came back, and now they are officially recognized as a cult. Uh, and they and they are uh, involved in the struggle, in the Notav struggle. So you, you have uh, Protestants, and, but you also have Catholics and anarchists fighting together side by side and agreeing on 80% 80 of things. Uh, this is also another thing that strikes you know, when, you, when you look at the Notav movement. You see old ladies praying with the rosary in their hands side by side with a, a hardcore anarchist from Turin, and they... And they love each other. That's uh, a fantastic thing. Then uh, you reach the border with France. Historically, the Susa Valley was the main crossing into Italy uh, from the west. It's where the Via Fran uh, Francigena arrived. And it's most plausibly where Hannibal entered Italy with the elephants. It's also where Napoleon entered to carry out his Italian campaign. It's where Caesar passed to go fight the Gallic Wars. It is an area of passage. It was historically conditioned and shaped by transit. But what does transit mean? In the past, anyone crossing the valley would exchange something with the locals. The Via Francigena was dotted with places for resting, with inns, with markets. Uh, you passed through the villages and it was a slow journey. Travelers left uh, something, perhaps just a memory of them, and took something with them. Another thing uh, that's quite interesting, because it explains a lot, is that before 1713, the Val de Susa mountains were part of the Dauphiné, uh, France, even the portion that today is on the Italian side of the border. As a result, uh, uh, the Susa Valley always had stronger relations with France than with Turin. Uh, still today, it is uh, perceived as not very Italian as a territory. It's uh, a strange place for many Italians with things working in a different way. Because up to the 18th century, the border was not on the ridge of the mountain. This is really a modern invention. The valley uh, still bears the traces of this. Its history derives from its geography. So I ask myself, how, how does this history come into play in the genesis of the Notav movement? I dedicated years of work to exploring the area, 
and uh, trying to answer this question, working on archives, doing interviews. I tried to outline my stance, my approach, my methodology in this 40 minutes long keynote speech. I don't know if I managed to do it. Uh, anyway, I hope that it was interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roberto, for this talk. Um, I especially enjoyed um, that you had made it so literary and so poetic. And um, the questions I've prepared are more a little bit on the organizational level, because of course this is a movement that's very striking and because it endured so long and it's so persistent. So of course we all would like to, to find out and learn from it maybe for the struggles that are ahead of us. So um, you said it yourself, there are very, um, a lot of historical lines in this movement. Can you maybe um, say, do you think it's, it's essential for this movement to have the recuration on partisans, on the working class movement that has a specific history in Italy as well? Yes, absolutely. There, are, there were certain phases in the history of the movement in which most of the communication consisted in evoking ghosts. Ghosts of partisans, ghosts of heretics, uh, uh, and uh, even uh, supernatural creatures. Uh, there's a legend, there's a notave legend related to the violent vacation of another big encampment in, in the summer of 2018. It was called La Libera Repubblica della Maddalena, the Free Republic of La Maddalena, which was uh, the place in which the encampment was. Um, after the vacation, uh, uh, one comrade got lost in the woods and he became uh, kind of an, an elf, a sprite, called Jaco, which is a diminutive for Giacomo, uh, for Jacob, okay. And one of the collective games that the Notav uh, play in the woods uh, in order to irritate the cops uh, uh, that uh, are all around the former area of the encampment where now there's, there's the construction site, um, one of the things they do is uh, looking for Jaco at dead of night, all around the construction site in the woods, and they start to shout, Jaku! 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 Uh, dozens of them uh, in a radium of two or three kilometers, and of course the cops uh, get uh, annoyed, they get irritated, they even get scared because they think there's going to be an attack on the construction site, on, on part of the Notav movement, uh, and, and uh, there, there's, there are stories about the appearances of this sprite, of Jaku, uh, and uh, there was a transmedia production uh, related to him, there's even a video game on Jaku, a self-designed uh, self, uh, and self-produced video game. There are action figures of uh, Jaku, there are fairy tales with Jaku as a protagonist. But also Jaku is strictly linked to the memory of the partisan resistance in, uh, in that area. So uh, we have a plan uh, in, in which we have a world in which a sprite can meet up with a partisan and they join forces to fight against a mega project. And does this, um, th do these encounter also uh, go so far that you have some sort of institutional um, links with some, uh, you know, like with unions, with parties? Is there also, is it just the ghosts that you link to or is the, you know, are you yeah. also linking to, to other parts of society in the struggle? Yeah, well, in the course of the years, the Notav movement conquered uh, almost every municipality in uh, the low section of uh, the Susa Valley. Dozens of municipalities, so uh, the Notav movement expre expressed the, the mayors 
and they have uh, they, they have the administration uh, they and so they can oppose can oppose the mega project uh, even uh, on legal terms they call it the barricades made of paper you know the paperwork because a barricade so we have constantly these two plans uh, in, 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 in interconnected uh, you have the, the direct action in the woods, uh, in the streets, you have marches, demonstrations, clashes with the police, barricades, occupations, and you also have the paperwork, as they call it, the paper barricades. Uh, and uh, they, they, there's no contradiction in this because uh, they, from the very beginning, they said, we're gonna fight um, this mega project by any means necessary with the stress, the emphasis laid on necessary, not by any means, by any means, any means we're gonna feel necessary. And this resonates with one of the five rules I listed about our poetics, tell a story by any means necessary. So these two, two feelings of necessities meet each, met each other uh, in my work on the Notav movement. So um, when I was uh, reading the news, I also came across um, uh, something that actually in the current, um, current coalition talks in Italy between the um, Democratic Party and the Five Star Movement, the no tough um, question played a major role. Is, do you think it's going to yeah. play a big role in the future of, yeah. of this uh, current government? Well, several governments uh, fell down because of the no tough controversy. Okay, in, in, in a direct or indirect way. Uh, and the, the, the last one, the far-right government, uh, uh, which was a coalition between uh, the League, Salvini's the League, and the Five Star Movement, uh, one of the major controversies for uh, the year and a half uh, that they lasted in office was Notav in the Sousa Valley. Why? Because where, where there's a real struggle a radical mass, a radical and radicated in the territory and rooted in its territory. Uh, well, there's a, this creates a gravitational field, as I tried to explain, uh, and, and so the the fate of the Italian of Italian politics in some phases depends on what happens in a very marginal peripheral peripheral valley. On, on the northwestern Alps, uh, at the border with France, this is fascinating. That's why I, I think that anything can be described best by studying its margins than by studying its center. So now, uh, two parties, two very different parties, who, um, who spent uh, the past uh, 10 years insulting each other, uh, the Democratic Party and uh, the Five Star Movement have uh, formed a uh, fresh new coalition. Uh, they, have, um, they don't have many things in common, uh, at least uh, at first sight. Probably they have more in common than they themselves think, uh, but uh, uh, the controversy within them is that the Democratic Party is a staunch defender of the mega project in the Sousa Valley, while the Five Star Movement, I think in a very instrumental and funny way, uh, used uh, the struggle in uh, Sousa Valley as, a, you know, as, a, uh, as a, an issue. Uh, they always uh, stated that they were against uh, the new uh, high-speed railway. They went to Sousa Valley many times, etc. I think it was all phony. It was all instrumental. And in fact, uh, during the year and a half in which they were in, uh, they in power, they were in government, they didn't do anything... Uh, uh, even slightly effective to stop this mega project. But uh, I mean, st uh, the the, the Notav movement uh, seems to be very, very effective in what they're doing, even chasing the governments. So if we look at the uh, uh, climate strike today and this new movement that's appearing in front of our eyes, what do you think uh, we can take from the Notav movement um, for the for new organizations or new movements that are forming right now? Uh, I think one of the most important lessons uh, um, uh, of the, the Notav movement, 28 years of struggle, is that uh, you as an activist uh, have to establish or have, 
since the beginning, a strong relationship with your territory, the history of your territory, the ghosts of your territory, the contradictions that shaped your territory. If you have a knowledge, a deep knowledge about that, you'll find the best strategies to fight in the territory. That's the key lesson of guerrilla warfare. After all, you have to know your territory and you have to know its history. Uh, you have to um, rediscover its uh, repressed uh, public memories. Uh, you have to investigate its uh, contradictions. You have to interrogate the ghosts. That's, that's uh, a very important thing. And they did it in a very effective way, spontaneously, because they started to reflect upon this only after many years. Okay, they realized, they lo looked back and realized they had a long history behind them, so they started to reflect upon it. And I arrived uh, uh, at the right moment when they were already, they were already uh, reflecting collectively upon this. This facilitated me a lot, okay, because when I asked them my questions, they were questions that they had already asked them themselves. If I had started working on an OTAF movement 10 years earlier, it wouldn't have been like this. Okay, so I think that the new movements uh, that are active uh, in the context of the global climatic uh, uh, crisis uh, can uh, draw interesting lessons from, from this experience. Unfortunately, um, books uh, on uh, the NOTAV movement, including mine, uh, so far exist only in Italian, and the struggle is not very well known abroad, but uh, I think it could be really, really, really useless. I think it's necessary that this struggle is, gets to be more known everywhere. So uh, I have one last, a, a bit personal question before we open the floor. Uh, and you kind of uh, touched on that already, that you have to know your history and you have to, to know your own struggles and your developments. And I, for me, it's very interesting to look at the history of media activism, actually, in the last 30 years. And I feel like there's not really a history to that. Like, of course, it has a history, but it's not a written history or not very much discussed. And I think there were some great changes also, of course, in the use of technology. But we had um, the movements around uh, the G8, the so-called uh, no global, um, global movement. And... Um, yeah, and I know that uh, we both were involved in, in these movements in the early 2000s. And um, yeah, I was wondering if there was ever the idea to, to write something like that history, a history of the last movements of the last 30 years. Uh, I hope someone does it, uh, I, but not me. I mean, uh, <laughs> because I, I'm already working on, on many projects. I'm, I'm, I think I'm three books ahead. Uh, I'm projecting, I'm planning three books ahead. So uh, I, I don't think uh, that um, I or we as a collective can do this, um, th this thing. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, at least in Italy, someone uh, were uh, doing that uh, because uh, in 2021, in 2021, there will be the 20th anniversary of uh, the G8 in Genoa, of the death of Carlo Giuliani, on the mass uh, violence uh, on part of the police and carabinieri against uh, uh, demonstrators. Uh, and uh, usually these anniversaries are only good for one thing, for, you know, re-elaborating your experiences. So maybe, who knows, before before the 20th anniversary of those events, uh, someone will have worked on, on, such a, on such a history of media activism in those days. So I would like to, to ask the audience to pose some questions. We have microphones, so please raise your hands. Come on. So. <laughs> Yes, I, I mean, this question also relates to long discussion that we had before <laughs> imagining uh, your presence here. And uh, I think it's also a really big uh, issue when speaking about the movements, uh, exactly the point of how to cover it and how to represent it and uh, 
the difficulties of it, especially if we speak about the not have. So I think that uh, uh, for me it would be interesting also in relation to the way we are framing this conference to understand what has been your relationship with the people of the movement, because in a sense you were part of it, but also outside because you were writing about it. Uh, so, if you can also tell us a bit more how you um, engage yourself in this narration and also being both part and not part of it. Yeah. Well, uh, when the book was published, of course, uh, there were several presentations in the Valley uh, with the presence of hundreds uh, of, of activists and some of them described the book as an autobiography of the movement, not a biography, which which kind of caught me off guard. Uh, but uh, then I realized, because there are so many voices in this book, because there are a lot of interviews of uh, statements and declarations, transcriptions of uh, 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 radio shows and uh, video documentaries and stuff like that. So uh, most of the time they speak in their own voices. Okay, and I connect the dots and I reflect upon my uh, very, my, my very research, uh, I ask myself questions on how to cover the movement because the book is also a reflection on how to write a book. It's a meta, it's a meta book in a way because at the beginning of the book uh, I'm uh, um, on, on, on the edge of a cliff uh, south of Bologna. It's a, a cliff when there's an important monument to the resistance because there was a Nazi massacre there. The place is called Sabuno. And I'm there and I'm looking northwards. It's a very clear sunny day and I see the Alps and I see the Western Alps and I say to myself, that's the Susa Valley. I've been writing this book for two years now and I don't know yet how to write it, even if I'm two years in, into the writing, because uh, I was eaten alive by doubts, of course, all the time, so I decided to thematize those doubts, uh, make, make them uh, uh, speak for themselves in many parts, but uh, the, in the other parts of the book are, are about the difficulties I encountered in writing these books and keeping it all together, which more or less is the difficulty I had in compressing in 40 minutes all the stuff I had in mind for this keynote speech, because you know it, uh, it's a struggle with a long history, with so many differences with, within it, uh, uh, with a long tradition spanning centuries, with ghosts of all kinds, with consequences of all kinds. So, so uh, one recipe uh, I, I feel I can give is thematize your own doubts about covering a movement. Okay, use it as a, a weapon. Okay, use the difficulty itself as a weapon and write about it. Okay, that's one of the, one of the first things uh, off the top of my head. Uh, the, other, the other thing was about um, being part of the, of, of the movement uh, or being an objective witness. You know, I, um, in 2014, uh, I was uh, interviewed uh, by a program on the BBC Radio. Uh, two journalists came uh, to Turin, where I was doing a reading, and uh, interviewed me about the Notav movement, because they knew I was writing the book, uh, and they asked me to accompany them to, in the valley at the construction site, so they witnessed uh, firsthand uh, the harangues, the, the controls, they were uh, they were asked their ID by the cops. Uh, they were they stood blocked for hours uh, in front of the construction site, and in in the meantime, the cops were uh, checking their IDs, uh, trying to understand why they were here, uh, and stuff like that. So they they witnessed this. And then then they, they re-interviewed me and said, "We understood what you're trying to do." But don't you think that you should interview also uh, the other side, the counterpart, the enemy? Okay, that's very British. Okay, uh, why not uh, interviewing the Minister of Transports? Why not interviewing uh, uh, the president of the company that has to 
excavate the mountain, stuff like that. And I answered like this. I said, look, since 1991, 99% of the mainstream media have defamed, slagged off, slandered and criminalized this movement. The voices of this movement can never be heard in the mainstream media. They are absolute criminals. I hear the other version every day, at every hour. What people don't know about is the position of the movement. You know, because outside of the Sousa Valley, there's a wall of disinformation and fake news about the struggle and the reasons of the struggle. And so I answered, to, I replied to the BBC journalist saying, I don't want to be objective, I want to be honest. That was my answer. Thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Peter and I was interested in two things. On one level, because you were talking about the movement and you mentioned that there were Catholics and anarchists coming together, loving each other and understanding each other for the same struggle. My question to you is, have you noticed, has there been any spillover effect of that positive collaboration into other topics where these people would then continue the struggle on other similar issues beyond the Notav, which is always then the question of how you can keep the love alive in other areas and other struggles. Yeah. And connected to this, the second question is more to you as, as a writer, but also in a way an activist using writing as your weapon. How do you see yourself in, in the kind of spectrum of citizens of evidence? Do you see yourself as the narrator of others and providing the evidence, or do you see yourself as collecting the evidence and offering, as you said now in the last point, that because there is lack of hearing these voices from elsewhere, is that your role? That would be interesting to hear. Okay. Thanks. Okay, the first uh, of the two questions. Uh, um, the NOTAV movement uh, is no longer about uh, the, no, uh, the TAV. Okay, of course, it's not a one-issue movement. Uh, it, it was at, at the beginning uh, but then it became so huge and so diverse uh, that uh, it started to uh, deal with uh, a lot of issues uh, related to the territory and the valley. Uh, the Notav movement organized strikes, for example, uh, strikes of workers. Uh, the Notav movement uh, is preoccupied on every aspect of the ecological crisis, for example. When there was a big fire, a huge fire in the Sousa Valley two years ago, which raged for uh, days and days and burnt uh, dozens of square kilometers of forests, uh, most of the volunteers that tried to extinguish those flames and self-organized to do it along with the proper firemen, but self-organizing, we're members of the NOTAV movement, uh, because it's not a one-issue movement anymore. Uh, Not, NOTAV uh, occupy places, uh, they are um, involved uh, in uh, struggles on housing, for example, uh, they uh, organized the picket lines to prevent uh, the shutting down of a hospital, many things. And you can see uh, people that come from very different backgrounds collaborating, working together. Of course, there are some frictions. They are unavoidable, but uh, they always manage to overcome those frictions, to find a synthesis and move beyond them. That's, that's what we, they always did. Uh, it's, um, it's a very, I don't know, it's, uh, it gives you a lot of joy to see that and hope. Okay. And uh, when you think of all the inner fighting in the left, uh, all the sectarianism we are so accustomed to, 
and you see how the knot of movement works with, of course, weak points, contradictions, occasional frictions, uh, uh, short crises. Okay, it's a movement like, like the other ones, but uh, they have something more. And why do they have it? That was one of the questions I tried to answer uh, in the book. And then my role, my role, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm one of the characters in the book. This is typical uh, of uh, our uh, UNOs, our unidentified narrative objects, that we ourselves are characters, and uh, the inquiry itself, the investigation itself, the archival work, uh, is not behind the scenes. It's part of the, of the narration, of the narrative, of the story that, that's being told. So I can play many roles. I can be the eyewitness to something that happens in which I have no direct involvement, but I can see that. Uh, I can uh, be a proper in detective, <laughs> a proper investigator, I mean, uh, trying to solve a case to use a metaphor, uh, I, I can be uh, an activist without uh, being afraid of being an activist because uh, this is not an objective book because I take sides since the, since the beginning. It's the formula of the unidentified narrative object, the fact that these books are so hybrid uh, that they cross different genres, uh, it, it allows us to uh, be very flexible about our own roles in the book. Thank you. Um, you've um, highlighted the importance of borders uh, and um, territories for the, 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 um, the struggles and f to anchor uh, these ecological struggle and give them um, some political um, influence. How do you see the articulation of these local struggles on a global level especially with the rising climate movement right now? Well, uh, for example, there is a, there, the, it already exists, um, a European Forum Against Mega Projects, for example, where there are dozens of committees of local movements uh, being part of this forum, uh, including the NOTAV movement, because they say mega projects are not a local problem, they are a systemic problem, they are strictly related to carbon emissions, to aggressions to the environment, to the climate crisis. So the, one of the things they usually say is non c'è lotta locale. There is no local struggle. Local struggles don't exist, especially in the context of the climate crisis, where climate is a global thing, of course. The crisis is global. And so even struggles that are deeply rooted in their own territories are global struggles because all the local problems are intertwined with each other and they are all part of a global environmental and climate crisis. And so I think that's the direction we should follow. Are there any more questions? Well, thank you then. <laughs>